the Northern Virginia Astronomy Club. I want to welcome everybody to Astronomy Day. Uh, we could have had a little bit better weather cooperating, but we've still got a tremendous lineup of speakers for this afternoon. I only want to take a few minutes and just publicly thank Paul Severance, Wade Hampton, and all the volunteers who put who put this program together for us today. Just heard everything. Thank you all. And then, uh, Paul, I'd like to invite you up here to introduce our first speaker this afternoon. Um, and thank you. Please, it's your show. Okay. Yeah, yeah thank you, Chris. Um, um, you know, what can I say? This, this, this hobby that we all, we all love and have a passion for, and, you know, it's not without many, many challenges, not, not the least of which is the, is the weather. So, you know, I was thinking, okay, what do we do when it rains? We, we put up a big white tent in our backyard, and we invite some tremendous speakers with great to relevant topics. That's what we do to get over that. So I think we, are, we will overcome our challenges today, despite the weather. Um, we've got three terrific uh, presentations lined up for you guys today um, and when you think of them together I think it's kind of cool because we're going to start with uh, Dr. Hess who's going to talk about the innermost part of our solar system the, the Parker probe mission to the Sun and then we're going to go all the way out to the furthest reaches of our solar system with a talk on Ultima Thule which was is a Kuiper belt object uh, that was had great interest here this year uh, from the New Horizons mission and finally, we bring it all back home to the moon. And we'll have Dr. Dvorkin uh, from the Air and Space Museum talk about the studies of the moon that kind of uh, led to the, the understanding of the soil and the composition and brought us to Apollo. And I think it's cool, especially this year because of the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, that we're lucky enough to get Dr. Dvorkin on our schedule for today, and I think it's going to be kind of a great little talk uh, to kind of relive that moment in history. So, great set of talks. Dr. Hess here is our first speaker, and I know a little bit about your background. He, he got his undergrad at uh, Seton Hall, correct? Physics. Uh, went on to earn his PhD at George Mason, and is currently part of the Space Sciences Division, uh, working out at the Naval Research Lab, studying the sun and all the various physics uh, on how the sun works, and um, it's terrific to have you here. And without further delay, uh, please welcome Dr. Hess. Thank you all very much. Thank you for having me. So yeah, I work at the Naval Research Laboratory, and we have a part to, in this mission, the Parker Solar Probe, so I'm here to talk a little bit today about what it is and what we hope to do with it. So I'm going to start off talking just about the satellite itself, the, the design of the mission, how, it, how it's all going to work. Then I'm going to get into a little bit more of the scientific background for it. And then a brief introduction to the Whisper instrument, which is the camera on board, and some of the data that we've already managed to collect in the short time that it's been in space. So what is the Parker Solar Probe? It's a NASA mission that its entire point of existence is to fly closer to the sun than we've ever been before with anything. So, the spacecraft was built at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory, not too far from here up in Laurel, Maryland. And it's also the first NASA spacecraft to be named after a living person. It was named after Dr. Eugene Parker, who, the reason we named it after him, I'm going to get into a little bit when we get into the science background. So, it's going to orbit closer to the sun than anything ever has before. It's got a plan for 25 total orbits. Its first science encounter was in November. It's going to keep getting closer and closer using Venus for gravity assists until eventually in 2024 and 2025 it'll make its closest pass to the sun. It's going to be about 3.8 million miles from the solar surface, which is about 4% of the distance from the sun to the earth. And just like a comet or any other planetary body, as it orbits in an elliptical fashion, the closer it gets to the sun, the faster it'll get, and then when it comes back out, it slows back down. So at its closest perihelion, it'll be traveling at about 430,000 miles per hour. So both the distance to the sun and that, that speed are records for a man-made object traveling in the solar system. So how can it do this? It's going to get that close to the sun. The spacecraft is protected by a heat shield, and this is the actual them putting the heat shield onto, onto the satellite. 
the very front of the heat shield is coated in an aluminum-based white paint that's supposed to reflect as much of the sunlight as possible. Then, this part behind it is a carbon fiber shell filled with a carbon foam. And I do not have any idea how the engineering of that makes sense, but somehow that takes a surface temperature from 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit to something about what we're standing in today. So this is a mission that actually goes back a long time, and the original idea for it was going to be to use Jupiter for a gravity assist and come in and make two passes that would actually leave the ecliptic plane and go over the poles of the sun. That would have the advantage of, one, giving us observations of the solar poles, which are very valuable for our research, and also it would get us in very close. I mean, right now, the plane is for about 3.8 million miles. That would get us in, you know, 300 times closer than that. The disadvantages of this approach we would only have two orbits. And not only would we only have two orbits, most of that time would be spent out here in cruise phase, and we wouldn't get that much time close to the sun. So, a new plan was devised that would come up and use Venus seven times for seven different gra gravity assists over its 25 orbits. That gives us 24 encounters very close to the sun, as well and more than 900 hours of observing time within 8.65 million miles. So, we did lose some of the benefits from the original mission concept, but on the whole, we think this is a trade-off that was worth, us, it'll, worth it, and it'll give us many more observations in the area of interest. So, the satellite actually launched from Cape Canaveral on a Delta IV Heavy with an upper stage on August 18th, 2018. It launched at about 4 in the morning. I was not there. I was watching it on TV, but that part was a little scary. Because that was the first time I had ever been personally invested in a launch. But the entire thing went off pretty much without a hitch. It went up. The boosters all de uh, deployed as normally. And eventually, this is an animation of it, the satellite decoupled from this fairing and all was well. And this is a, an image of the actual satellite inside that fairing that was on top of the rocket when it launched. And... Again, here you see that white heat shield. That's the reflective part of the spacecraft. So this is what the spacecraft actually looks like. This is sort of two views rotated around. There are a ver various different instruments that I'll get into the details of, but there's antennae here that'll do measurements. This dish here is the antenna for how we communicate with it. And then here are the solar arrays. You can see them a little bit better in this shot. So you can see here in this one, they're kind of bent back. That's by design. The in these are solar panels that are collecting light from the sun to power the instruments on the spacecraft. At larger distances, everything is fine. If we left those solar panels deployed when we started getting in closer to the sun, the amount of light and radiation that they're picking up would fry them instantly. So these are set up to when we get into a science mode, they go back behind the heat shield, basically just stop doing anything and the instruments run on the batteries then as soon as we get out of that encounter period when we're a little further from the sun the solar panels redeploy and we start charging things again so I showed you that antenna communicating with this mission is a little bit different for us most of the missions that we've already launched are what we call synoptic missions meaning we put them at a, either a point in space or in a steady orbit in space and we talk to them whenever we want so we can get data down multiple times per day. We can send new commands up for new observing sequences multiple times per day. We don't have that luxury here. For the one thing, for a lot of the period of this orbit, the sun's between us. And we don't quite have a transmitter powerful enough to overcome all of that solar, solar uh, emission. For another thing, because the spacecraft always has to be oriented with the heat shield pointed towards the sun, that means it doesn't matter where that antenna is. The, the heat shield pointing is always our biggest priority. So for half the time that it's orbiting, the antenna is on the complete opposite side of the spacecraft and we have no hope of talking to it. So we have to be very careful about planning our sequences, p getting data down, and having a very strict schedule of the few periods that we can actually talk to the spacecraft. So, for instance, the first science orbit was in November. 
We stopped observing on November 12th. We collected a very little bit of data in December just so that we could know our instruments were working. And then it wasn't until about April that we actually had all of the data from that orbit down. The sec And this changes from orbit to orbit based on the configuration of everything. So the last orbit had a perihelion in early, in early April. We already have about 80% of the data from that orbit down. So it's one of those things where it's disadvantageous for us because if we took observations on the first orbit and we want to know how did we do, do we need to tweak things, we couldn't do that before we had to submit our observing plan for the second orbit. So it's a very long-term thing, and it's why these first few orbits are kind of experimental for us because we don't really know what exactly we're looking at yet. So the instruments that are on board, there are four. There are three in-situ probes that will measure solar wind conditions as they pass over the spacecraft. The first, fields, based out of the, Cal the University of California in Berkeley, will measure the electric and magnetic fields in the solar wind. The second, the integrated science investigation of the sun, is somewhat unfortunately named. Because this went back... The, the planning for all these instruments goes back more than a decade, and at that point, they thought it was a great idea to make an acronym for this instrument based on the Egyptian god of wind. Since then, having an instrument named Isis became somewhat problematic. There was some talk of, should we change the name entirely? Should we do this? The problem was, at that point, there had already been enough things published and out there in the community that there was a big fear that there would be confusion about that. So this symbol that was included in the name is the astronomical symbol for the sun. And then everybody tries to go with the more European pronunciation of Isis, and that's how we've tried to get around this problem. But that aside, this is an instrument that's designed to measure solar energetic particles that are elevated up to GEV energy. I mean, th these are some of the most energetic particles we observe in the solar system and have direct impacts at the Earth, and that's why this sensor is on board. Then last, there's, or last of the in-situ probes is the Solar Wind Electrons, Alphas, and Protons, or SWEEP investigation from the University of Michigan. This is these three different instruments, and that the job of all of those different things is to observe different particle parameters in the solar wind. Density, velocity, temperatures. To give us an idea of, combined with that ele magnetic and electric field data, what exactly the conditions of the solar wind at all of these different heights are. So then, lastly, is the, ima is the imaging instrument, the Wide Field Imager for Solar Probe, WISPR, which was built in Washington, D.C. at the Naval Research Laboratory and has two white light cameras for imaging the solar corona. And I'm going to get into a little bit more of the details of this at the end of my talk, but this is the only remote sensing instrument on board. So there are three science goals for the Parker Solar Probe. Trace the flow and energy that heats and accelerates the solar corona and the solar wind. Determine the structure and dynamics of the plasma magnetic fields at the sources of the solar wind. And explore mechanisms that accelerate and transport energetic particles. In short, there are still huge outstanding questions in solar physics in terms of why the corona is so hot. And in t similarly, th that heat from the corona is what accelerates the solar wind. So those, they're two very related processes that we know are there, and we have theories about what's going on, but we've never had the direct observations to really address them until now. And then this last one about the energetic particles is this kind of different thing that affects space weather at the Earth in a very direct fashion. So the sun. In basics, it's a G-type main sequence star, and it's pretty standard by stars. It's, n it's nothing particularly special. It's got a temperature of between five and 6,000 Kelvin at, its photos at the photosphere around the outside. That's the surface. It's got a very strong magnetic field that's responsible for a lot of the actual structure that we see. And in this image, this shows you all the different layers. Where on the inside, you've got the core, which is where nuclear fusion is actually happening. And then the radiative zone here is that energy coming out until it's convecting out towards the surface. Then you've got prominences and flares, which are coronal features of things that are happening above the surface of the sun and causing notable impacts further away. So the sun has a very well-defined cycle. It's an 11-year periodicity of activity. where So this is from 1996 to 2006. 
And back here is solar minimum. There's not much in terms of solar activity. There aren't many flares or active regions or CMEs. You could call the sun kind of boring at that point. There's still a lot going on. It's just compared to the dynamics you see at solar maximum, it's it seems a little dull. And right now we're more or less, we're in solar minimum. We're gearing up towards the next solar maximum. We should be in it before the Parker Solar Probe ends its first ends its last science orbit. So why does the sun have a cycle? And it, it all comes back to its, the sun's magnetic fields. So this image on the left is from solar minimum. And this is from a... The magnetic field here is real photospheric data of the solar surface. And then there's a, a mathematical extrapolation to determine the magnetic field that this causes. And at minimum, it looks kind of like you would expect from a, a simple dipole, like just a bar magnet, like anybody might have played with in elementary school where you've got these big open field lines they're not really open there's no such thing as an open field line but in terms of the sol our interaction with it they're open out into the solar corona and they go off like this and then you've got these much more closed low down structures back towards the surface so this is relatively speaking a very simple dipole magnetic field this is what the sun is like at solar minimum the problem is the sun also rotates differentially. That means there's angular there's a different angular momentum at the solar equator than there is at the poles. So it actually rotates faster at the equator. Now what that does is it stretches these north-south magnetic field lines in a more of an east-west direction. And at solar maximum, you've got the maximum distortion of that non-dipole component of the magnetic field and now you've got a very chaotic and jumbled magnetic field on the solar surface. So now we've got open field lines going off in different directions. They're not completely misaligned. We've also got closed structures over here. That's what gives you that sort of bumping up of different magnetic regimes. That gives you your CMEs. That gives you flares and that's what gives you your solar activity. But then at the same time those subsurface motions that give you the dipole field, those are still happening all through solar maximum, and eventually they're able to sort of restore order on the solar surface. And that's why it just keeps bouncing back and forth between minimum and maximum. So, some of those coronal st structures we're talking about that you may have heard of if you hear people talking about things like space weather or solar impacts of the Earth are CMEs, which are these big impulsive eruptions but we also have a lot of other coronal features that are important. So you have these bright things over here. Well, it's bright in the start of the image here. That's a streamer. That's what we call... That's part of what we call the heliospheric current sheet, which is, back in this slide, this sort of belt around the equator in minimum that's a lot more jumbled at maximum. That's sort of the point where the different polarities from the different sides of the magnetic field meet with each other. That's going to come up very important when it comes to the solar wind, as will coronal holes, which are these dark features that correspond to dark features actually on the solar surface, where those open field lines come from, and the magnetic field is very strong, and they appear dark in these image cause, images because their density is low. So these are all going to be important structures in terms of what this Parker Solar Probe is observing and what we're trying to find out about the sun. So what is the solar wind? We know that there's a constant outflow of plasma from the low solar corona that we now call the solar wind. Why does that happen? Because the, sol the solar corona is extremely hot. It's about 2 million Kelvin. It ranges between 1 and 3 in most cases. It can get hotter. And when you have that much thermal energy, there's a pressure pushing outward. And there's nothing to constrain that pressure because all that's out there is the interstellar medium, which is very low density. And the, so the sun... The solar atmosphere has to keep going out until there's something that can rein it in. And so as the pressure gets, as the, the solar wind gets further from the sun, its, pre its density decreases, its pressure decreases, and then eventually these things will reach an equilibrium. But that was not, now we know that as a given. It's something that everybody can kind of take for granted. It was not always the case. And so in the 1950s, by then we knew the temperature of the corona, but we still didn't know that much about the solar system. So Sidney Chatton was one of the first people who first theorized that you have this very high pressure in the solar corona, so that must cause this solar atmosphere to expand very far from the surface of the sun. 
he kind of theorized it as something like the Earth's atmosphere, where it was in hydrostatic equilibrium, and it was just sort of a fixed, constant solar atmosphere. But people had also been observing for a long time that comet tails were always pointed away from the Earth. Or for, away from the sun. No matter where they were in their orbit, the, po- the tail was always pointed radially away from the sun. So a German scientist named Ludwig Biermann f- was the first person to publicly publish that there was a constant stream of particles coming out of the sun and pushing these comet tails away and causing this. So then, coming back to Eugene Parker, for whom the Parker Solar Probe is named, he was the first person who really thought I think these two phenomena are linked, and instead of having a static corona and hydrostatic equilibrium, you have, I think you have a constantly outwardly flowing group of material from the sun, and that's what's causing these comet observations. So he first did a purely analytical solution for how these particles could escape the incredibly high gravity of the sun and actually form the solar wind. And so this plot is from a, a reprint in 1972 of his original paper, but this is basically what he found analytically as the solution for how a corona, an isothermal spherical corona, so it's still a very simplified structure compared to what's really there, could escape solar gravity and get out. And he found four classes of solutions, but he knew that the solar wind, if it existed, had to start at a very low speed, and that's what's on the y-axis here is speed and distance. The speed had to be very low, and as it went outward further from the sun it had to eventually get higher. So you could throw out class 4 and class 3, which both had a very high initial speed for these particles in the solar wind, and you could also throw out class 1, because that wouldn't actually reach the speeds necessary to form an outward flow. So that left this one simplified solution where you had a a speed near zero that comes up, hits a critical point here, which is where the solar wind becomes supersonic in his case we actually now know it's a little more complicated than that but it eclipses the local sound speed and eventually it forms this outward flowing solar wind now in 1958 when he first published this this was actually very controversial and the paper he wrote was actually rejected by two reviewers in the astrophysical journal and it was the famous astrophysicist Chandrasekhar who was the editor of the journal at the time who actually overrode his reviewers and demanded this paper be published. And then, a few years later, we started launching probes out into the solar wind and pretty much everything he wrote was confirmed. We knew it was a little... His version was a little simplified. It was a little too theoretical. But this idea of particles constantly flowing out of the solar wind, we knew it and it's become sort of taken for granted now but that's why we named a probe after Eugene Parker because in a lot of ways he's sort of the father of modern heliophysics so this is a a simulation from a a model called Enlil which is used both operationally by the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center and also for research purposes to try and estimate what the solar wind looks like in the sun and this model takes magnetic field maps at the sun and uses them to extrapolate what the solar wind would look like And so I put this in here just so you could see sort of what the basic structure of the solar wind looks like. So these plots here are all colored based on speed. And so the blue is the lowest speed, and it ranges up all through the red. The the slow solar wind here, this blue and the green, that's got speeds usually around 350, 400 kilometers a second. Then there's fast solar wind, which is lower density, but as the name implies, very fast. And that'll propagate out at about seven or 800 kilometers a second. So this is from, if you're looking at sort of the north pole of the sun looking down, what it looks like. And it's got this very f- clear spiral pattern. That's because the solar wind propagates out radially, but while it's propagating out, the sun continues to rotate. And so that's what causes all of these. And so the magnetic field lines that come out with the solar wind, they remain connected to the sun, and that's what these sort of breathing little field lines that you see connected to the different spacecraft and planet Earth here, that's what those represent as magnetic field lines. This view here is if you were in the ecliptic plane looking at the sun and the Earth, and what you can see here about the divide is that generally speaking, because this is closer to minimum, it's in 2016, the slow solar wind is coming from 
around the equator. And the fast solar wind is coming up from the poles more likely, and then occasionally some of it comes up and gets into the ecliptic where it can reach the Earth. That's because being in solar minimum, we're back in that simple dipole-like magnetic field, and that's where the open field lines that generate the fast solar wind are coming from. And then this is, if you sort of unfolded the sun and into a big rectangle, that's what it would look like in terms of the source of, that sol of the different regimes of solar wind. So even though you could probably say most of the solar wind coming out is fast, the Earth is far more likely to encounter slow solar wind when you're in a solar minimum. So this was a mission launched in 1990 called Ulysses, which is one of the few missions that has actually left the ecliptic plane and gotten observations of the solar poles. So again, this plot here is the sunspot number and showing you're in maximum, coming down, minimum. Go back up to maximum, and then you come back down to another minimum. So the first Ulysses orbit was in a solar minimum. And what, you could, what it observed was a very well-defined, simple uh, velocity field. Where around the poles, the different colors here are different polarities of the magnetic field. One's going in, one's coming out. And that's your high-speed streams. Your slower, your slower solar wind is coming from over these streamers in that streamer belt. And it's the same way in the other solar minimum, except now the poles have been reversed. And what was once going inward is now coming outward and vice versa. But at solar maximum, it's just sort of a big chaotic mess. And you can get fast wind from anywhere, you can get slow wind from anywhere. What One of the things that Parker Solar Probe really wants to see is, we think we understand the fast solar wind pretty well. It's coming from coronal holes, that's open field lines that we can trace all the way back through, through the sun. The slow solar wind is coming from above these streamer belts. We know that, but we don't exactly know where that material is coming from. There's some thoughts that it's the open field lines from here interacting with the streamers from here. There's other thoughts that there's this big network of open field lines that's formed between these. We really don't know yet, and one of the big things we're trying to hope we see is the different structure in the solar wind that can point back to a definitive source for any little bit of the solar wind. So, the next big problem that Parker Solar Probe is really meant to address is called the coronal heating problem. And that's because if you, that, that Eugene Parker paper, that started with the assumption of, we know the solar corona is this hot, so what will that do? What that doesn't address is, why is the solar corona that hot to begin with? And that's still sort of the big unanswered question in solar physics. Right now, there are two big theories. One is that it's waves coming from closer to the core of the sun that get propagated outward, and when they hit the surface, they release energy out into the solar corona. The second idea is that it's actually small solar flares, so small that we can barely observe them, happening all over the sun at any one time. And... E even though any one of those flares would release a very minimal amount of energy into the solar corona, the hope is, the, the theory is, you'll get so many of those happening all over the sun that, that in, in total, that will give you what you want to the energy that we see. But it should be noted, these theories are not mutually exclusive. It's quite possible that both of these things are happening on the sun and they're both contributing to this massive heat that we see generated in the solar corona. So, why will Parker Solar Probe be able to help us with this? Well, right now, we've only ever been able to measure the solar wind directly near 1 AU. And at that point, you can think that the solar wind is already sort of finished. I mean, all the structures are more or less formed. It's out there. It's done. We're hoping that we can actually get inside the regime where the solar wind is still being accelerated and then see what kind of structures are in there. Are we, see are we seeing sort of different little blobs that get pushed together and stacked on top of each other and eventually get pushed into a structure, that would be more of an example of the nano flare problem. So that's what we're really hoping to see with Parker Solar Probe is why does the solar wind get so fast and why is the corona getting so hot? And then the last science goal that we were hoping to look at is solar energetic particles. So, like I said, these are a very significant space weather concern, and 
so the, when you hear people talk about space weather, they're frequently talking about coronal mass ejections. Coronal mass ejections are sort of the big concern of space weather because they're the ones that cause the big geomagnetic responses and events that you sometimes read about in the news where different things are happening and satellites are affected and power grids are getting affected. SEPs generally don't cause that kind of big wide-scale disturbance. The reason we care about them, though, is they're very sudden. And while CMEs are propagating outward at speeds similar to the solar wind, which means they take about two or three days to reach us, these solar energetic particles are reaching us in matters of minutes. They're, they're you know, approaching the speed of light. So this is an image from the SOHO mission, which shows a bunch of coronal mass ejections going off, and then you see a bunch of very staticky noise come on the detector. That's actually the detector picking up these accelerated particles, and they're hitting all over the camera. So we think there are two main sources for SEPs. They can come from solar flares, or they can be accelerated by shocks that are driven by CMEs. The reason why we want to study them now is because while we know the general basics of why we're getting SEPs, we still don't know the microphysics of how are the shocks generating these SEPs and how are they reaching the Earth. There's still debates over where, how the particles are getting accelerated to the very high energies we're seeing. And the hope is we'll be able to see some of these particles very close to the sun and get a better idea of the interplay between the shock and the SEPs. So that's, in a very, very general sense, the sort of science we're hoping to learn from this mission. And so getting more into the, detect the, the instrument that I know the most about, which is Whisper, and the imaging instrument, the Whisper instrument contains two 1920 by 2048 pixel APS detectors. It's like a CCD, but it's a little bit different in terms of how it's getting read out on, on the uh, satellite. And the detectors don't observe the sun directly. They're actually pointed some degrees off the solar limb to observe the solar corona. And what they're observing is photons that get scattered by electrons of structure. So what they're, they're really... They're white light observations that are essentially electron density measurements. The detectors are pointed it's it not quite a fixed angular distance, but a roughly a fixed angular distance off the sun. But because the spacecraft, the distance from that to the sun is changing so rapidly, the actual heights it's observing change just as rapidly. And the whole point of the instrument being added onto the spacecraft was so that we could image things directly that hopefully then the spacecraft would be able to fly through and you'd say, oh, we saw that CME, we approached it, and then the in-situ probes could actually measure the magnetic field inside of it or the density inside of it. But we're really there to provide context for the other instruments as well as complement some of our other missions that are already observing the heliosphere in a more constant and consistent fashion. So this is a, an image showing sort of how Whisper is going to observe where it flies into the sun, these two different lines represent the fields of view of the two instruments, and as it flies in, it's observing different parts of this CME structure that's coming out. This sort of changing perspective is going to introduce a lot of extra complexities for us trying to analyze our imaging data compared to other satellites. So this is sort of giving you the same idea. This is from the SECI suite of instruments on board the one of the stereo spacecraft, and so this is an image taken from the ecliptic plane viewing the sun. But imagine now you're at the solar north pole looking down. Here's the orbit of the spacecraft, and here's the fields of view of each telescope. And you can see the pointing of it is changing very rapidly. That's one practical, because again, we always have to have the heat shield pointed at the sun, so th the alignment of the spacecraft has to be fixed, and it's also because we're interested in the solar corona, so we always want those cameras pointed at the solar corona, no matter where we are in the orbit. So we image from about 0.25 AU and in. The rest of the time that we're in orbit, we're not collecting data. That's when we're doing more downlinks for, data, for, for the data we've already taken and uploading our next observing plans. So this is just one more animation to show what this is they're going to be observing, again, from the Secchi suite of instruments. And this is showing as the spacecraft travels in close to the sun, 
how the fields of view of the telescope are going to be changing. So this instrument here observes out to about 15 solar radii. And just for context, 1 AU, this distance from the sun to the Earth, is about 215 solar radii. So this is changing pretty rapidly when we get to our closest perihelion. And this outer telescope will go out to about 50 solar radii. So this was our first white light, our first light image taken in white light of the galactic center. So this is taken, we weren't in a science orbit yet, we had actually, we were fairly close to Venus at this point, and we were pointed away from the sun. So it's a very beautiful shot of the Milky Way. This is in the outer detector, this is the inner. And there's, it's so clear because right now we're looking out away from the sun there's not much density, and you really get a very nice shot of the star field and the Milky Way. The Milky Way here looks very nice. It's actually, for us, and this feels weird to say, a source of noise in most of our data. Because when we're observ observing the sun, it's still there, and we don't want it there. I mean, this, is, this isn't a mission to observe the galaxy. This is a mission to observe the solar corona. And so this is just sort of, for us, one more layer of noise that we have to try and figure out how to remove. So this is another interesting image we've taken from the commissioning phase. This is before our first science orbit. We were just taking sort of test images to make sure everything was working properly. And this is actually pointed right back at the Earth. Again, we were near Venus at this point. And then there's this sort of weird data artifact, which I'm sure somebody is going to try and claim as a spaceship because that's what always happens in our data. But so we get this image of the Earth and then when one of our, our scientists looked at it very closely, he actually noticed there's this little bulge right here. That's not noise, that actually is the moon. And we did some careful calculations to observe the phase of the moon and where it would be relative to the Earth, and we are completely positive that these little, like, two pixels here off the edge of the Earth that make it non-spherical, that is an observation of the moon. So... That's what our data should look like. The problem is going to be, when we get close to the sun, how do we make it look like that? And that's because the vast majority of the signal of the solar corona is what we call the F corona. That's the interplanetary dust, which when you get further out from the sun, you might have heard referred to as zodiacal light. Well, when you get closer to the sun, there's a lot of that dust. And it's very bright, and it actually makes up about 95% of the signal in all of our images. So when we, on past missions that moved very slowly and didn't change their perspectives very much, we got around that by saying, we know this F corona signal is very stable. It only changes on the period of months as we're orbiting the sun. Whereas we're interested in more of this very subtle, dim feature that you can barely see, but that's changing on a time scale of hours or days. So the, the way for our past missions like SOHO and Stereo that sit and point at the sun is you take a week, a day, a month's worth of images, you stack them up, and you take an average. And you say, that's going to give us the stable signal that's in all of these images. We remove that, and that gives us the transient signal that we're interested in. And this plot here is the relative brightness of the total image and this, this dust corona. And at the heights that we're looking at the sun inside 20 solar radii, it's almost our entire signal. So getting rid of this background is sort of our biggest challenge for the Whisper team. So for our first encounter, we were able to sort of make a first pass by just taking a median of all our data and an analytical model of what we think the dust should look like based on past missions. And it actually did a pretty remarkable job. So this is the first streamer that was observed by the Whisper instrument based on 12 images. Because our first downlink, we only got 12 images over a period of 12 days, so one every 24 hours. And this bright feature here, that's Mercury. And it's you, these dark circles on both sides of it, because we had to take the background based on all of the images we had to us, it shows up as this sort of negative feature. Going forward, we, that won't be an issue for us when we can actually do a little bit better job of modeling the background. For now, this is as good as we can do. But this is still problematic for us because this dark feature up here, we've lost all of that. I mean, we it get, this gives us a general context of here we see a streamer. 
it doesn't allow us to see a lot of the finer detail that we're really looking for with this mission. And that's why our biggest task right now is constantly going back and reprocessing the data and trying to make sure we can isolate some of these more subtle, faint, transient features. So that's about all the data I can actually show you at this point because right now it's still under embargo. On one hand, that's because the team's... I mean, on one hand, the team should have the sort of first crack to analyze data and get some of the scientific discoveries out of it. But on the other hand, it's also because we still don't know exactly what we're looking at yet. And so before we publish the data and make it available to everybody, we kind of want to have a firm idea of, yes, it's processed, it's calibrated. These features you're seeing, we can confidently state those are physical features. And, you know, to that thought, a couple of weeks ago when we got our first to orbit data down, one of the guys who's working on a lot of our image processing came to us and said, I think I found these really big loops in the extended corona that we never thought we've seen before. And we were all blown away by this because they sh really shouldn't be possible. And we had this big meeting where we spent like two hours trying to figure out what these could be. And then the next day he sent an email and said, oh, they're an artifact of my processing. I already did it and they're completely gone. So that's why we're keeping the data under embargo so that people... Don't go, who aren't going to go back and double check their work, don't think they're seeing these physical features, and really it's all just an impact of the data. I can say, though, that so far we've seen multiple CMEs within, within the data art itself. There's going to be a lot of very good papers and research done with, the, with these in conjunction with the other observations we have. We've also seen a lot of energetic particle and dust particle hits from different sources. Some of them are actually energetic particles from the sun coming out and we're observing them just like we hope to. Some of them are actually dust particles that are either impacting with the spacecraft or we think they might have been things that were actually like dirt on the spacecraft when it launched that are coming off as it's orbiting. So that's one of the things we're going, we have to keep an eye on as we're going forward and going from one orbit to the next is how that's changing because our hope is that's just a little bit of dirt that got on there. It'll burn off, and after the first couple of orbits, all that dust will be gone, and we'll be left with just clear images. That's probably optimistic, and some of this is probably stuff that's already in the solar system that we're going to have to try and figure out how to remove from our images. But, like I said, we're still doing a lot of experimenting at this point to try and make sure we've got the right exposure times and the right sums of images to get the most out of it, and it's really no different than any other observing data from the ground, from the sky, where you really have to make sure you're doing it right to get the most out of your data. So, sort of the final remarks I have, the Parker Solar Probe is definitely one of the most ambitious space ex exploration missions we've ever attempted. I had nothing to do with the engineering of it, and I can only sort of tip my cap and marvel at everybody who actually managed to pull this thing off, because it really is remarkable that they managed to build a spacecraft that's on one hand, it's been called the most autonomous sp spacecraft ever built, and that's because that whole time it's going around the sun, it's got to automatically detect everything that's going on and make sure that pointing is exact, because if the spacecraft point comes off pointing by just a little fraction of a percent, instruments start getting fried, and we lose the entire thing. So they've really done a fantastic job with this. It's a mission that I think a lot of people in the community are really excited about because it should directly address a lot of our long-standing questions about the sun and specifically about the solar corona that have been lingering now for 50 years and still haven't been answered. And to this point, everything's good. The mission's operating well. We've got the data that in some ways is better than we expected and in some ways worse, but that's sort of what you take except with a mission like this. So thank you very much. So the actual operational phase of the mission is now until 2025. So the reason, well, one of the reasons they chose to launch this one they did is because it missed its first couple of launch windows. But I do think this is a very good time to do it because it gives us a few orbits at solar minimum to sort of be like, here's what the quiet solar corona looks like. And then it'll let us slowly see that ramping up phase through solar maximum, e getting a little bit more activity and a little more activity and give us a chance to try and decipher what we're seeing before we hit solar maximum. I think if we had just dropped right into solar maximum, we would be seeing so much in our data that we would have no idea what's going on with it.
Yeah, I just remembered that now. So, so she asked, where do we call the transition point between the solar corona and the solar wind? That's really kind of a subjective de- definition that, depending on what exactly you're looking at, people might have different definitions of it. Generally speaking, I would probably say something around 15 solar radii. Um, that's when you start seeing more and more just purely radial structures coming out. The, some people would say it's probably like four, so, two or three solar radii because within that, you don't really have any more closed structures back to the sun. All you have is things flowing out. There's not really a set definition of... It's kind of like space, where you hear people say, what's the limit of outer space? And some people say it's 50 miles. Some people say it's 75. It's really the same thing with the solar atmosphere, where what's the definition of the corona versus the heliosphere? It's a little subjective. Yes. So there's some energy transfer going on there. And why isn't that slowing down the differential rotation? I'm sure it is. I'm I'm sure that's slowing it down and that is working as a damping force. I just think it's it's just not enough to really overcome. On the slide with the rectangles done, which I had to laugh at Yes. Uh, I might have missed this because of the rain, but is there a reason why there seems to be one direction that kind of sweeps around where the wind is faster? So, yeah, let me go back so I can actually demonstrate this a little bit better. But so the question was about why the solar wind is sort of in this sh- this shape, in this pattern where it's all sweeping around this way and that's so the sun's rotating and as it's rotating these solar wind this solar wind is all coming from roughly the same spot on the photosphere on the surface so it's that's what's forming this big spiral because the magnetic field is still kind of connecting it but the velocity of it is still radial from the point it came off the it came out of the corona but when you've got this fast speed stream here, that's going to bump up against these slow speed streams and push up against them and distort them. And so that that process alone can actually generate sort of shocks and transients that form right on these boundary lines that we can observe the Earth and can cause space weather effects themselves. But really, it, it always comes out that way just because of the rotation of the sun. I believe it is... Th- uh, he asked about how the, the spacecraft is maintaining its pointing. I believe it's thrusters, but that's way above my pay grade, so I couldn't tell you for sure. So the data will all be cleared for public release in October. And at that point, there's going to be a special issue of either the journal Science or Nature that will just detail the first results from all the instruments. Shortly thereafter, there will be a special issue from in the Astrophysical Journal about the science that's been done so far on the data. And at that point, you'll probably start seeing more press releases coming out and a lot more outreach in terms of, you know, here's what we've what we've seen so far, and then so yeah, November December. There's also the the big American Geophysical Union conferences in December, so there's going to be a lot of talks for that, and there's probably going to be some press releases in re- relation to that. So around then is when you'll start seeing more. So we just completed Science Orbit two last month, and Science Orbit three is in August, I believe.